that that we do make that distinction. It's mostly uh, the distinction is mostly between the new and the old covenants, though. Yeah, that is the distinction. Right. There are some verses that are attributed to the Elohist. Yeah. In the Old Testament, and yeah. those are plainly Canaanite El references. Well, you know, I went to church Sunday. Okay. Yeah. And this upcoming kid, he's a good kid, mm -hmm. uh, married to another leadership person in the church, wife, child. And anyway, he's up and coming. And he's got a lot of passion and good heart, but they don't know. Mm. And he was talking well, about... what they know. He's, right. Uh -huh. And he's talking about uh, the relationship with Jesus and, and being so tight that you can see him even in throughout the Old Testament and everything. He said that, that your eyes get opened up to what you can yeah, actually see but, it. But we've, we've put that in there. I know. Uh -huh. But that... Well, I know. He so, don't know. So he's going through all that and I'm thinking, no, you can really see if it only meant that the reference of that being where the God's wisdom really does shine, even in the Old Testament, you know. In the few places where there's the wisdom of the ages that cannot be ignored or denied of being good and solid. Mm -hmm. You know, the only thing that bothers me about telling people, no, the Canaanite El is your God, I frankly think it's above that. Mm -hmm. That all of these were sons of... The Sumerian story is there was a God named An, A-N. Right. And son I knew mm -hmm. had Enki and Enlil. Okay, so we attribute El to Anu, not An. Okay, so it's the same story as all I'm trying to say, but there's still yeah. a higher God. There's man's yeah. conception and, and man having to make it what he needs it to be to, for him to grasp it. But there's the God that goes beyond understanding and everything, and that's who God is. Yeah. That's the God that's they're, so vast they're, that we they're can't really, they're, They are absolutely, absolutely correct when they say there is only one God. Right. No doubt. There is only one. But it ain't none of those gods. Right. Those are lesser beings. Those are created as well as we are. Yeah. And it don't matter what planet they came from or uh, where they originated no, no. or and what the hell That's difference could it possibly uh, make to anybody. We've got to get past all these conceptions and move on here. That's all. That's yes. All. Def yeah, yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. yeah I mean, I'm, I'm on that point right now. Well, good. Of moving on from the Old Covenant. I don't right. like to say the Old Testament. I've got one here that I'm going to get you to read about the Torah. Okay. I know but that those first right. five books. It's, instead it's, of saying the Old Testament, it okay. really ought to be the Old Covenant. Look, we're past that, people. You made a covenant with the wrong God. And here we go. It's, it's, it's new. Look. Well, here. while I'm all fired up about this, let's do... <laughs> The first five books of the Hebrew Bible are called the Torah. Until this very day, the text, which was originally written in Hebrew, has been carefully preserved by and for the Jewish people. They say the books were written by Moses and dictated by Yahweh himself. Most Orthodox Jews see every letter and every nuance as a sacred communication from Yahweh, filled with significance and meaning. It contains their 613 mitzvahs, meaning laws. And these laws are considered divine commandments that shape the life of Jewish people everywhere. The Torah is read from no less than four times every week, and the entire text must be completed once a year. The name Pentateuch is a Greek version of the Torah. The Greek word Pentateuch means five books. You've heard it called the first five books of Moses as well. Traditionally, it is understood that the Torah was written by Moses, except for the last chapter of Deuteronomy, chapter 34. Because, if you remember, it describes Moses' death and burial, and describes handing over Jewish leadership to Joshua. I suppose in another day they thought Moses was so enlightened he was able to write about his own death. That's pretty sharp, huh? They got past this discrepancy, and now there seems to be another problem. According to most biblical scholars, the main problem with the Torah is that it is a compilation of myths, legends, and folklores with little, if any, real historical basis. Alongside this one fact, 
I would think any additional problems would seem small and insignificant. But you could call the contradictions in the Pentateuch, just from the Hebrew to Greek, an additional problem. And many have worked hard to reinterpret the text in order to make it seamless. Much time has been spent doing just that. They were in the hope of proving to the Gentiles the virtue of Jewish religion and thereby influencing these people's outlook on and attitudes towards Judaism. Here's a few New Covenant verses on the subject of what Jesus changed. 2 Corinthians 3, 6, He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Colossians 2.14 Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Hebrews 8.6-13 says, But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator in superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. The only thing the Old Covenant and the New Covenant have in common is that they were both written by Jews about Jews for a Christian audience. Hmm. However, neither group would truly accept the other because they are two truly different things, regardless of how much one group wants to claim dominion over the other. But look, if we believe that Jesus is in fact the Son of God, died on the cross and was resurrected, then the New Covenant overrides the Old at least it should for the Christian believer. And if that is not the case, then we better start saving up for offerings. You know, bulls, birds, goats, rams, all without blemish, of course. And don't forget your cakes and breads. Plus, we better cut out the pork, shrimp, and catfish. Man, that ain't gonna happen. This is among the many other Old Covenant laws that are broken every day by most of us. And Yahweh finds it to be an abomination. Let me give you a much easier solution. Rather than try to fix the issues or solve any of the contradictions to make these stories meld together, like why bother, why don't we wake up and remember we are not held to that old covenant anymore anyway. Got it?